You're listening to The Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. Whether you need an inspirational pick-me-up or a swift kick in the mental ass, The Gutsy Podcast is your bi-weekly guide to getting out of your head and back into action. I'm Laura Ora, branding and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs, CEO of Works & Co., and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. It's time to fuel your gutsy. The very thought of hitting the live button on Instagram or Facebook or stepping onto a stage makes people cringe. What if I forget my words? What if they see my armpit sweat? Who cares what I have to say because a million people have said it before me? Today, we're going to learn how to amplify your voice. And to do that, I have the most magnificent Melanie Spring. Melanie is the chief storyteller and approachable badass, we're going to talk about that, (laughs) at Melanie Spring Productions. She believes that when we share our stories, we connect with each other on a deeper level. And when we make friends with our fear, we can step into who we've always meant to be. Melanie has worked as a brand strategist with businesses of all sizes, from big brands like Five Guys to brand new entrepreneurs. This lady drove 7,000 miles in three weeks on her Live Your Brand tour to find out why great brands work and discovered that humans were at the center of everything. She's an international keynote speaker, storyteller, and public speaking trainer, and when she's not rocking the business... She's living the Colorado life, climbing mountains, and chasing sunsets with her husband and her pup. I am super excited to have her magic with us today. Melanie, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You are like a speaking queen, so I'm really pumped to have a conversation with you today. I'm excited to watch you do it. (laughs) (laughs) So before we started recording, I was like, Melanie, I'm a little bit nervous because you're like the speaking queen and I feel like I really need to bring my game today. So, (laughs) hey, well, there's no judgment over here. That's 100%. You do you, I do me. We'll do it together. So do it together. Mm -hmm. So you're basically an all around badass in general. And I know that it's been a journey to get to where you are today. So (laughs) tell us a little bit about your backstory, your entrepreneurial journey. Oh, man. Like, if you guys saw me 10 years ago, you'd be like, that's not you. I actually sent a picture of myself from 10 years ago to when I first started my business, which was 11 years ago, I sent a picture to one of my current employees and I was like, hey, um, so this is me from 10 years ago. And she's like, I don't, you're not in that picture. I'm confused. (laughs) Where, where are you? What? That's, could you send me the real picture? That would be great. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I've learned how to own my own self. And as I've been doing that, I've learned how to help other people have permission to do the same thing. And it's only come recently that like the permission piece is the piece that has been really hitting home. Like this journey has been insane. So I won't go off on the topic of permission yet, but the journey of being a business owner, I mean, I started my first business in college when I was 20 and my goal was to make $30,000 that year. And I was like, that was the hugest goal in the whole world. Cause my rent was 200 bucks a month. I was like, all right, if I can make 30 grand this year, I'm buying myself a car. (laughs) I'm making bank. Yeah. Like I'm going to own this. And I was making eight fifty an hour at the college as their webmaster. And like everyone in town started asking me to do their websites. And I switched majors from English into communications. And I started like acing all my classes and I'm like, Hmm, I think there's something to this. So when I got into brand strategy, it was because I had been in marketing and then I went into advertising. I sold billboards in Buffalo in the coldest winter they've had since like 1850. Like, come on. (laughs) So like, this hasn't been a sexy journey. I even went into HR and sold people for two years, which was awesome. Like I picked people out of one company, put them in another, but I started realizing that I was learning from all these different places and I didn't notice it until much, much later that I'm like, oh, I understand how all these work because I've been in them not just been a brand strategist my whole career. I'm trained that way. Like I've been in this for so long. And by the time I became a brand strategist and started my business, it was because my boss was like, what would you do if I couldn't pay you anymore? And I was like, I'll work for myself. And he's like, great. (laughs) Glad you have a plan. (laughs) And he said, you have 30 days. And I was like, cool. Oh, shit. Shit. (laughs) 
that was in 2009. You know what happened in 2009? The whole world crashed. So it was like, okay, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but that's, I'm going to start here and see what happens. So basically I started my business because I had to get pushed off a ledge and yay, I did it. But, um, over the years I started in brand strategy and I did websites and marketing materials and logos and all the stuff that you do for that. And realized after five years that I was totally burned out on it. And finally, after eight years quit, <laughs> decided I didn't want to do it anymore and started becoming a full-time public speaker, which I thought was insane. So 11 years later, you know, COVID hits, speaking isn't a thing anymore. And I'm like, well, <laughs> shit, <laughs> how do I do this now? So that's kind of my journey in a nutshell. But basically it's like a whole bunch of what the hell just happened and fixing it and changing it and crashing and burning and fixing it and changing it again. So. I mean, that's basically entrepreneurship summed up in one sentence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's just a constant, it's a constant evolution of, oh shit. And oh, yay. Yeah. Like every day, like every moment of every day, I feel like. Yeah. This morning yeah. I woke up and I totally was crying on my husband and I was like, I just can't do this. We have our lunch today and I don't know what to do. And he's just like, do you want some breakfast? And I was like, yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. That'd be great. And then a little bit later, I was like, we just sold our last VIP spot in Suku Confidence. He's like, really? You're just... You were crying a few hours ago. <laughs> the good thing I'm married to an entrepreneur. He totally gets it. <laughs> See? And, and that's exactly why this podcast exists. Because otherwise, like what I might consider outsiders or non-entrepreneurs we're just bad shit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Bad shit most, crazy. Most people are like, most entrepreneurs end up marrying a non-entrepreneur and they're sitting there like, what is your problem? Which is why all these groups came out with like, hey, let's get entrepreneurs together and like learn together. I was like, are you kidding me? I have my husband in the other room. I'm like, honey, my funnel broke. And he's like, I'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> That's extremely handy. Yeah. But most people don't get that. And I'm like, well, man, you have to be crazy one to marry an entrepreneur Two, You have to be crazy for two entrepreneurs to marry each other. So truth, just don't start a business unless you know that you're batshit crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Mental note. I'm going to put these in the the, the show notes. (laughs) I'm going to see that on Instagram soon. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I find something super intriguing about your journey and it's that, that secondary pivot moment, you know, being pushed off the ledge is one thing. That's find your wings on the way through. Yeah. But that secondary pivot moment is really intriguing to me when you were like, I hate doing that now. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. And then switching into becoming a speaker. So what was that transition like? Well, I went to Bali, you know, as white girls do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, found myself in Bali on a yoga retreat, <laughs> which is actually true. <laughs> I did that. And basically I was sitting there in a yoga class, realizing that I had hated my business for the last three years and was trying to escape it for so long. And I was like, but how do I do that? That's not possible. And as I was like really thinking about what I wanted to do, I was also thinking about, well, I just broke up with my boyfriend. My business is in a good place. Like I'm halfway around the world doing yoga with people I don't even know. And like trying to figure out this new space for myself and having that moment to breathe those two weeks to just be like in myself instead of in everything all day. Cause you know, that's what we, all we do is we just sit there and we're just in it all yes. day. Pounding. And it's hard to think when you're in it all day. So having that space to do that, I actually wrote a plan, my five-year plan for where I wanted to be. And I was in DC at the time and I had this branding agency and I came home and shut down the branding agency. Even my team at the time, like such amazing people sat me down and said, what would you do if you didn't have to pay us? Like, what would you be doing if you didn't have to like think about having to put food on our tables too? And I was like, I would speak. And they're like, do that. I'm like, how? I can't do that. Like, yeah, I speak, but I get us clients. Like, what am I going to do? Speak for money? (laughs) Guess what? You can do that. (laughs) So it was a, I mean, it was an evolution. I didn't just like call my clients and say, screw you guys. I don't want to hang out with you anymore. But it was like a slow, okay, well, what if I did this? And what if I launched that? And I started talking about it and I started sharing it and started getting on podcasts and like doing my own podcast, like all the stuff that I was doing. And I even ended up within four months of getting back from Bali. I did that in March, August. I met my now husband And I had put on my five-year plan that I wanted to live in the mountains, that I wanted a chef, and then I wanted to be married. And 
six months after that, I actually moved to Colorado and my husband took a Gordon Ramsay's masterclass and <laughs> oh, he did wow. it. So I'm like, well, I mean, that's a chef. It's cool. I mean, <laughs> so Gordon, learning from the master himself is, is pretty fantastic. So exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I basically, it's taking the time to just really rethink what do I want to be doing and actually deciding I'm going to do this, which goes back to what I say all the time. I'm like, you have to manifest that shit. And it's figuring out what you want, which is the hardest possible thing. Like, what do I actually want? Not what other people told me or what I'm trained in or what I'm like, what do I really, really want? And then writing it down and then making a plan and working on it every single day. And that's the only reason I ended up becoming a full-time public speaker where I'm like, I literally travel and speak for a living. And, you know, I think you said something so important there is thinking about what you want, like what makes you come alive. We get so wrapped up in the noise and the, well, what if this happens? And and what is that person going to say? And well, if I do all these things, then the, you know, you get caught up in this shit storm in your brain. And then, so then we stay behind the computer and do the thing day in and day out <laughs> and then wonder why we're like losing our minds and mm-hmm. in our hearts, honestly. So it's really just about being still and being honest with yourself. And that can be scary. That's a, that's a vulnerable it's place. Really scary. Really scary. I was just talking to my friend Ati about this the other day. She's been an entrepreneur. She's a home renovator and she's been on HGTV. She's had her own TV show. Like she's all traveled all over the world. Like she's amazing. And she decided she lived in DC and was like on the brink of full on crash and burnout. And she was just like, I'm taking my family on a sabbatical and we're moving from DC to San Diego for a year. We're going to see what happens. She shut her business down she like took her family to China for like two weeks and she like did all of these amazing things that like she wouldn't have had time to do had she been like in her business all day. And she's like, it wasn't easy though. Sitting with yourself all the time sucks. <laughs> like, yes. Oh, I'm just sitting here thinking. I'm just, that, that's all I get to do today is just think. And you're like, I don't really like the conversation. Shit. How do I fix this? And she's like, that was the hardest thing for me to learn. It was easier for me to work all day than it was for me to sit and just be because I had to actually listen to myself. Well, it's super easy to listen to all those other things, right? To other people talk, other people's words, what everyone else is doing, what everyone Mm -hmm. thinks is right for you. When you're sitting, okay, we are just, just barely, if you're listening to this in real time, just barely on the other side of kind of opening up from COVID. Right. (laughs) We've had a lot of time to sit and think by ourselves. And that's been, you know, in talking about your friend, I've been sitting alone a lot. (laughs) (laughs) That voice gets very loud very quickly. It's like, oh, hey, oh, hey, we're going to talk now. We're going to listen. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because like, I actually started a talk that I call my Rock Your Life talk with a, a podcast episode I was listening to called You Listening to You. And it was just this episode by Rob Bell, who he was sitting there talking about how we forget to listen to ourselves. And then he's tasked all of us. He's like, okay, now I want you to shut everything off and be quiet. And I was in the car driving from an airport in Kentucky, like three and a half hours. I had like a four hour drive total. And so I started it with the podcast. I got in the car and just sat for hours just listening. And I was just like, after a while, I was like, so you're going to say anything? <laughs> Like, like I couldn't, I couldn't understand what was happening because I'm like, I don't ever get a chance to just sit and listen. And so I was driving and there was a part of the drive that was in a construction zone and a semi, as it started raining, started moving into my lane and there was a concrete barrier on the other side. And so I hit the gas on this rental car and like just barely made it around the front of this thing. Cause he couldn't see me at all. I must've been right in his blind spot. And it terrified me to the point that I was sitting there shaking in the car And all I heard was, I trust you. Wow. And I was like, I just started bawling in the (laughs) car. Like, it's pouring. I'm bawling. And I sat there because I was thinking, I'm like, you know how to drive. You're from Western New York. You've driven through anything. Are you kidding me? You're not scared of a little semi. This is stupid. What is wrong with you? Like, why are you so scared? And I sat there realizing that I hadn't been asking myself what I thought about stuff. I hadn't been trusting my own decisions. Every time I made a decision, I was like, Hey guys, what do you think? And then I would listen to what they said and then it would fail. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm really good at this stuff. And yes, it looks like nothing anyone else ever does and it always works. So why am I listening to the experts about this stuff? And it made me think, how many times do we sit and go, what do you think? 
Melanie. Melanie, what do you think about this thing? And then listen to the answer because it's hard because we want to have other people who are experts tell us what to do. But we have all the answers inside of us all the time. We just forget to ask ourselves. So true. Oh my gosh. It's like you're speaking right to my soul. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is the gutsy podcast and listening to your gut is kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. It's, uh, It's a blinking red light that if you don't, pay attention to it. It will shine into your eye mm-hmm. in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that there was something really interesting when we were, when we were prepping for our call and you made a comment that not knowing how to manage your finances ruined your ability to be a great leader. Mm-hmm. And then you came across this book, which of no coincidence, I literally can't make this shit up. I just downloaded two days ago, yeah. <laughs> which is called Profit First. So yes. talk to me a little bit about that financial situation and how that affected your leadership and kind of that turning point as well. Oh my gosh. So years, a couple of years ago, I had like started doing the public speaking thing and was like, okay, I don't have this brand strategy agency anymore. I don't have like a billion clients that I have to manage all this like cash flow and figuring out like invoices and all this stuff. And I started looking at my books and I was like, there seems to be a big problem. Like I'm never making any money. Like I don't understand what this is. And now I'm in like a cash business where I'm like, yes, we're making lots of money. And it's like an hour of my time is $10,000. Thank you very much. Like how am I not making any money? So, and I started looking at it and I was like, we're not able to do what we want to do in the way we want to do it because we're not putting the money where we need to. And so my bookkeeper at the time looked at me and she was just like, have you heard of this book called Profit First? And I was like, "Uh, no. She's like, when you get on the plane tomorrow, I want you to read the first five chapters. I flew through the first five chapters of that book. And she said, as soon as you get back, I will implement this for you. And it's basically setting up six bank accounts, three checking and three savings accounts. You don't have to do that. But like the way that I set it up, it's much easier to like move money around. And each one has a name, like taxes. (laughs) <laughs> one is savings, one is owner, one is um, operations, one is revenue, and then one is payroll. And every single check you get, so let's say I get a $10,000 check, I split that percentage-wise into every one of those six accounts. Because you're focused on the profit first, not the bills first, it's the profit first. And so you're putting money into a different accounts like payroll to go, I have money to pay a new person because now I know I can hire them because I have money in that account for that person. Or I know that every three months when I actually go in and say, did we rock this quarter? I have an owner drop money that I can actually take out and put in my own bank account because like, good job, girl, I got it. And then there's money for taxes. So like you get to the end of the year and that 20% that you got to pay is in there. And if you know what, you got a whole bunch of write-offs and you killed it. You can put that in your savings account or take it as an owner's draw as like a celebration kind of fun. But all of the money gets moved into different accounts and you can do this in your head. Like you don't have to do this like in bank accounts, but it's kind of nice because it's kind of like what my mom used to teach with like tithing and savings and spending. Like you had three little jars and you put your little like money in it every week. And that's what you did with each of those different things is making sure that you know where your money is going and what's happening. So right after that, I was like, oh, well, now that I know how this is working, I started taking over my own books and hired an outside person to do reconciliation, but I started managing my own books and we started making money. And I was like, how come this never happened before? (laughs) So 11 years later, I was like, okay, I should have read that book the first week I started. And I probably would have actually made money the whole time because I knew I would have known how to make decisions because most of us are like, going with the, oh, I think I can figure out how to pay this person when you hire them instead of, can I actually pay this person? That is a true story. You know, Mm -hmm. it's as, as an entrepreneur, you're figuring everything out on your own and, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I think the finances is uh, a huge portion of that, but it's also really intimidating to a lot of people. So Especially as creative people. Especially as creative people. So (laughs) listen loud and clear to Melanie. Read Profit First, no matter where you are on your journey. I literally just downloaded it two days ago. So I will be binge listening to it as well. It's so easy to read. But also if you have a bookkeeper, if you have somebody who's like helping you with stuff, 
have them also look at it and then figure out what your numbers need to look like. Cause they can actually look at it and go, Oh, well, these numbers wouldn't work for your business, but if we do it this way, then, or we can work up to those numbers. Cause it doesn't have to be like, you just jump in and start right away. Cause otherwise you'll probably lose your business. <laughs> but if you can actually start building it into that, it ends up becoming so helpful in the long run. It takes a lot of pressure off your shoulders too. Oh my gosh. Yes. <clears throat> Any pressure, it would be good pressure to take off. <laughs> that is true. Any weight that you can take, that would be awesome. Mm-hmm. So you are working with what you like to call kick-ass humans. And mm-hmm. I am super curious what, what makes up a kick-ass human. Well, that's funny you ask, because I literally asked the club the other day, what is your definition of a kick-ass human? <laughs> There we go. (laughs) Years ago, I was working with a bunch of different clients and I started looking at the fact that I was a brand strategist and I hadn't fully defined my target audience. I was like, yeah, I want to work with small business owners. And after like five years of doing that, I was like, I don't want to work with small business owners anymore. (laughs) And I started working with like, how do I want to get into corporate America? How do I get into bigger clients? How do I, how do I do I work with the entrepreneurs and the small business owners who aren't going to suck me dry every time I want to work with them? Because you know, there's those people who every time you get an email, you're just like, Oh, why are you emailing me again? Like, or you have a call on the schedule and you're like dreading that call all day. You don't have to do that. That's the fun part about being an entrepreneur is you can say no to those things, but sometimes you don't see it ahead of time. And sometimes you're like, aren't they going to be good to work with? And if you have a filter, you can go, Oh yeah. So I only work with kick-ass humans and you're only allowed in if you pass this test, basically, whatever that is. And so I put on my website specifically, I only work with kick-ass humans. And I had the judiciary department of a college call me <laughs> and say, hi, before you say no, we are kick-ass humans. It might not seem <laughs> like it, but we are kick-ass humans. And what I realized is if you try to offend people, those people will go away and the right people will show up. And I realized that if I say I only work with kick-ass humans, there are some people who are going to be like, oh, I don't want to work with her. No, thank you. And even with speaking, I had to start doing that too, because people would be like, hi, I know your card says approachable badass, but do you mind just not bringing your cards? Because I just don't think our audience will like that. And you don't say any sweary words on the stage. And I was like, I will never drop an F-bomb on anything. Like I'll do it personally. I'll do it offline. I'll do it whatever. But like, I'm never going to be on your stage and drop an F-bomb. I'm never going to write it in an email. I'm never going to be like cast in that light ever. Because as a woman, that's really tough. Because just even saying shit or ass on anything is like, a woman said a swear word, what happened? But at the same time, I'm like, if you don't like it, I don't want to work with you because I'm going to push your buttons. And it's not just the words. Words are just one little piece of it. It's the fact that I push people way past their boundaries and they're like, that's uncomfortable. And if they don't like it, then they're not going to like me. So I'm like, if your people are open to it, then I'll be willing to come work with you. But if they're not, I don't want, I don't want to sit in front of an audience of people who are like, full time. I mean, nobody wants to. So how do you make sure that your clients are the perfect clients for you? So I ask people to to start a club. I'm like, if you define who you want as the person you want, which for me, kick-ass humans are people who are growing, who are evolving, who want change, who want to keep moving forward, who want to be amazing and kind and generous. And I don't want people who are just going to sell me stuff all day. Like I want people who are actually going to give, like give me stuff. Like I'll pay you for it, but like give as much as you can. Don't just sell me on something. And so when I defined that, it started, those people just started showing up and I was like, oh, hi. And then people were like, oh, you have a club called the Kick-Ass Humans Club. I'm a kick-ass human. Can I please? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you can. But if you start a club, that's kind of like starting a country club. Who comes to a country club? They all wear the same clothes. They all look the same. They all feel the same. And if you start a club online, that's exactly what's going to happen is the right people will show up and they aren't going to all look the same and dress the same, but you'll get the, you get the idea. You want to make sure that it feels like it's a membership for people to go, Oh, I want to opt in to this because this sounds amazing. This totally fits who I am. Well, and there's something about that too, that sometimes that's the encouragement or the courage that they needed to be able mm-hmm. to step into being truly who they are. Because that's yep. also a scary place and thing. I can completely relate. Like, it's like, hey, could you maybe not say cuss words? And I'm like, okay, have we met? Can we not be <laughs> have, friends anymore? Have, that sounds have, great. Have, <laughs> yeah. Have you listened to prior episodes of this podcast? Because <laughs> I will drop the F-bomb. And mm-hmm. it's just, I have colorful language. Yeah. But sometimes it's being like the space keeper. 
Yep. And when you hold that space for someone, it's not that they are or want to be or have to be exactly like you, but there's a characteristic that they see within themselves through yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And so when you have this club or you have this target audience, right? This defined market that you work with, you give them the permission that they didn't need to step into who they are anyway. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's all about giving permission. Like some people just need the permission to go, you know what? I am a kick-ass human. Like I told my mom, I was like, mom, I'm going to start this podcast. And she's like, if you drop any F-bombs, I can't share it with my church group. And I'm like, I don't want to <laughs> drop F-bombs. So that's cool. Are, are you cool with like a kick-ass humans club? And she's like, yeah, I'm a kick-ass human. I was like, cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're on the same page. <laughs> What is it about, because you mentioned permission earlier and you just mentioned it again about like when we're talking about amplifying voices, which is Mm -hmm. a whole nother thing of, of you, (laughs) right? So what is it about the permission that we need or the permission that we're seeking to feel like we have the ability to amplify our voice? It, It goes back to the permission. Sometimes we don't need someone else's permission to do it, but sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to say what we need to say. And we're in like a crazy space right now where people are like, I don't know if I should say something. Should I say something? Ah, Can I say something? How should I say something? If I do say something, when should I say it? Like all of that. I mean, from the pandemic to the riots and the protests to people finally standing up for what they believe in and standing up for other people at the moment, which is the biggest thing. Like the more we can stand up and amplify our voices along with giving permission to other people to amplify theirs, there's so many people now telling their stories that wouldn't normally ever tell their stories. I mean, I've been seeing white people all over the place talking about their stories of the racism they've encountered themselves and how they've had to relearn how to do what they do because they're, they would have never shared that before. They would have never been like, let me be super vulnerable as a white person and show you about racism. Like they're <laughs> actually finally sharing a lot it's of true. that stuff. Though. It's true. And it's and a it's, hard conversation to have. So it is the permission piece. Yeah. And it is the, it's that container again, right? Like now that they're, you know, it's sad that it has taken this long for all of these voices to come to the forefront, but I'm so glad that it's happening now because there's, there's so much to stand up for and be vulnerable about. And we haven't gotten it right and for a really long time. And now yeah. com- people are joining forces and, and pushing their, their friends and, and neighbors into the, in the limelight. And it's really beautiful to, to see that. And that's yeah. the power of the voice, right? Yeah, exactly. Because if nobody said anything, this wouldn't be happening right now. If everyone was quiet and nobody bothered to speak up, we wouldn't have what we have right now. Yep. And that's whether you're right or wrong, or you're on the all lives matter versus black lives matter spectrum, like whatever happens, we're all speaking up finally. And even the people who still haven't unlearned the all lives matter, thing, <laughs> I think a lot of that is the people who needed to step up for black lives matter to help them understand, I get you. And this is why this is a thing it's finally starting to shift a lot of things and it's starting to shift the, the voices in how we're speaking. It's not just, we have to say something. It's how can we say something that will help, not just hurt? Because whether you're on one side or the other, I've seen people hate each other for stuff like this. And I'm just like, this isn't where we need to be doing this. This isn't about hate. We've had hate for too long. How about we start going, let me teach you. Let me show you a new way. Let me, even if you don't agree with me later, at least I took the time to educate you or show you that there was a different way, which is, I think, where the amplification of voices is coming in right now, where we have to start speaking up. Otherwise, even if we're wrong, we should still speak up. Like, even if we're not doing it exactly the way that we should do it, whatever that means, I think it's because we need to start doing it so that we can see, are we wrong? Are we correct? Are we hopefully helping in some way? I think that you hit the nail on the head. Even if we don't do it right, we yeah. still need to do it because there's yeah. growth in that. That's where mm-hmm. we we learn and being open to to criticism or feedback or, hey, I saw what you wrote or I heard what you said and maybe could I introduce you to another aspect of this? And right. that's where the beautiful growth is coming into play. It's it's really cool to see people locking arms and, and joining forces and, and standing up for something using their voices. Yeah. So let's amplify some voices. I think the million dollar question or and or comment is, who the hell gets paid to speak? 
<laughs> you know, that's it seems sometimes like such a an ambiguous, like only there's only a special set of unicorns that are born on the earth that get paid to speak. And if you're not one of those people, then you're not going to be one of those people. So why should I try to begin with? Do you hear that? Mm-hmm. I hear that all the time, actually. <laughs> well, and so because I, like, this is kind of an aside to this, but it will feed into this exactly. But a couple of years ago, I started training other speakers, not because I wanted to train people. I never, ever asked the universe to tell me <laughs> this. It was not on my list of things to do, but the more I was speaking, the more people asked me that exact question. Well, how do you get to go on that stage and get paid a ton of money? And why can't I do that? And I was like, well, do you have a demo video? And they're like, a what? And I was like, well, if you can prove that you're good at it, people will pay you for it. It's really that simple. And then I had to go get a demo video and was like, Patrick, my videographer from Patch Bay Media, he's amazing. And he's in the DC, Virginia area. So he he and I got together and I was like, how do I get a demo video? He goes, well, most videos suck. So, um, it's going to be hard and I don't know what to do, but basically he was just like, why don't we get a theater and get a bunch of people in it? And then you can get up and speak and then we can videotape that. I was like, yeah, but that sounds really dumb to be like, hi guys, come hear me speak. (laughs) And he's like, well, why don't you train a bunch of your friends? And I was like, I mean, maybe I could do that. So we did it. And then everyone was like, oh, I want to do that. And I was like, we're not doing it again. They're like, yeah, you are. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to need you to do that again. Okay, thanks. You know, like, what can we do already on that one? I want to be on that stage. So we did it a second time. And I told everyone, I was like, never doing this again. Two times was enough. And then I moved to Denver and we did it a third time. <laughs> <laughs> so we started doing this thing called Speak With Confidence. It used to be called Rock Your Talk. We started doing Speak With Confidence because I was like, well, what if I got to keep learning and keep growing and keep getting better by helping other people keep getting better. And I'm like a systems person where I like, I love to create workbooks. I love processes. I love like dissecting how something happens. So I started watching all the best speakers in the world and started dissecting how they did their talks. Then I started looking at TED Talks and I was like, I don't want to do that because that's a box and I don't like boxes. So how do we like reorganize this in a way that anybody can take this information and put it in place? And what I realized the key, besides having a demo video, was having a specific set of processes to creating a kick-ass talk to get people to go, oh, can you do that to my audience? Because every time you speak, you get other people to go, how much do you pay? Like, how much do you get for that? And even if you do it for free, which I did forever, like I think seven years of speaking for mostly free, I did that, but I wasn't planning on speaking. But what if I fast-tracked it? How fast could I have gotten to getting paid for speaking? Well, it's called asking for it. And if you're really (laughs) good at it and you ask for it, people pay you. It's like, simple. It's so So, simple yet so complicated. (laughs) So complicated, but that's literally what we just launched today. I don't know when this is airing, but like literally just launched today, we launched our new website with the Speak With Confidence 90 Day Challenge because I used to charge, I put an entire online course with 150 page workbook together and was like, I'm charging a thousand dollars for this thing. And the retreat's expensive. And because we're doing all the things and I just like launched it for 97 bucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was like, what a perfect time, which we planned on already. But then like the whole world's caught on fire. And I was like, oh, Amplify Voices. That's my whole job. What if we got to amplify a lot more voices really quickly? I already built the online course. Let's do a 90-day challenge. And it starts July 7th for 90 days where we get people to go through the entire course and it's a hundred bucks. Like, okay, how do we do that more? And so it's like, how can I go back to my mission of amplifying voices and getting more people to get on stages, to talk at protests, to rally around their friends, to say what they need to say, to tell their boss what they need to tell them, to get up on stage and be the sponsor for an event, whatever it is that someone's doing, even at like a podcast episode like this, being able to help them own their voice and amplify it and make sure that their stories are getting out there because what are we without stories? What are we without stories? <laughs> I, I love that you you mentioned too, you know, it's not always about being a keynote speaker, but just having, speaking up in a family situation or at work or learning how to ask for something with confidence. And, you know, we we speak and communicate in some form or fashion every day. Yeah. And, and that people may look, ask me that all the time. They're like, I don't speak. And I was like, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. On your website, you have a line that says, what would happen if you stopped apologizing for showing up and started saying you're welcome? 
I so love that. You just saw my website today, huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I may or may not have been snooping around on there. No, it's it's brilliant stuff. So I'm curious, what do you find is are some of the biggest hangups that people have when it comes to speaking or, you know, whether that's in their inner circles or approaching a career as a professional speaker? It literally goes back to, you just said this up perfectly. It goes back to not apologizing anymore for showing up. And it's not asking permission to do it either. And I think a lot of us sit here in our like, oh, should I say something? Should I not say something? Will this affect my career? Will this not affect my career? Will I get a raise if I ask for this? Or mm, should I, will I lose my job if I ask for it? And most of it comes from a place of fear where it could change to excitement. And so when speakers are like, I'm really scared to get on stage. I don't know what to do. And I was like, okay, well then sit with that feeling for a second and ask yourself, is it actually fear or is it excitement? Because fear and excitement feel exactly the same way in our body. Like physiologically, our bodies are set up to go, (gasps) and it feels like total fear. But if we stop thinking about the fact that it's not about us, it's about them, then it switches how we feel about it. We can feel the exact same feelings, all the butterflies, all the like, because we want to make sure that it's so impactful for the people we're talking to, whether it is our boss or our coworkers or our husband or wife or kids or whoever we're talking to, if we stop worrying about what am I going to say, how am I going to say it and think, how am I going to impact the people that I'm talking to? And what is the impact at the end of the day for them? Not for me, for them, it switches that into excitement and it changes that feeling into something that you're like, oh, I'm going to walk in there and be like, you're welcome. I just showed (laughs) up. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. That's such a great way to just reroute yourself in the moment. Cause I think Mm -hmm. that that like right before you step into whatever that conversation is, whether it's in front of one person or 10,000, you get that like nauseating kind of, I'm going to puke, but also I'm yay (laughs) feeling the sweaty armpits, the the total sweaty armpits, you know, light gray shirts and sweaty armpits are not a good time. I wear black for that reason. (laughs) I'm sweating through my shirt. I'm not at all scared, just sweating through my shirt, just sweating. Mm -hmm. But if you reframe that and, and think about them, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. such a good human thing to do anyway, but really just in that moment, getting outside of yourself and into them. Yeah. That's a power shift yes. where, where you're really taking your power back, honestly. Mm-hmm. Well, and it comes from a place of, I, I actually started this because I was at a tech conference with women and it was a full tech conference with a ton of people, but I spoke at the women's summit that happened right before the tech conference started. And I watched a woman walk down the hallway and I watched a man walk into her shoulder and she said, I'm sorry. And I was like, ah, what the heck was that? Like, <laughs> Does that happen? She's like, Melanie, that happens all the time. And I was like, then you say, excuse you. And she's like, oh, that's a new one. All right. I can start saying excuse you. And then I heard a pastor talk about how he said, what if you don't have gifts? What if you are the gift? And I was like, what? Yes. And then he's like, what if you walked in a room and you were like, you're welcome. And I was like, oh, that's the like linchpin for everything I've been talking about. Like, it's not about me. It's about you. You're welcome. Like, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so being able to walk in and stop saying you're sorry, especially as women. Oh my gosh. The more women I hear that are like, I'm sorry, but I just had a, qu-. I'm like, stop apologizing. Like just remove the, I'm sorry until you need to say it. Save them. Save them for the times you actually fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Save See? them. I dropped an F-bomb on the Gutsy Podcast. You're See, welcome. you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, how do you work with women specifically on the, oh, a thousand other people have said this before me. Like, why would anyone want to hear me? I I don't have anything new to contribute to the conversation. That's just, (laughs) that's fear talking and a whole bunch of bullshit. So. (laughs) Well, okay. Noted. (laughs) She's like, all right, I'm writing that down. Got it. (laughs) No, but most of the stuff that we talk about, everybody has heard everything that anyone will ever say. There's nothing new anymore. Like, Someone has already invented gravity. Like, we're good. Like, we're like, oh, it wasn't invented. Oh, it was already there before. Cool. Like, we actually can talk about it now. How great. But we put things in a way that other people can understand because we have our own filter for everything we've been through. So you've had a life that I haven't had. We might have had a few of the same scenarios happen. Like, I've lost a house. I've been divorced. I've had, like, childhood trauma. I ran away from home when I was 17. Like, 
my first boyfriend had sex with someone else and had a baby with them. So now I have like, a, he's got a 20 something year old at this point, like that kind of stuff. All of these crazy things have happened, but your situation would be totally different from mine. Even if we went through the exact same stuff, because you would have filtered it differently. Your parents are different. Your upbringing is different. Where you grew up is different. Who you are as a human being and what you were intrinsically put here to do is different. Your view of the world, we could have done the exact same stuff, but your view would have filtered it totally differently. You would have picked up certain things from podcasts or talks or conversations that I would have totally glossed over and not even heard about. Like I would have been like, you really were in be in the same room? How is that possible? I mean, how many of us have siblings that are literally the opposite of us, but we were raised in exactly the same home with the same parents? Right. So it's that kind of stuff that gives us the filter and that gives us the ability to change how someone hears it. So my talk, Rock Your Life, people have heard probably 300 times before me ever saying it. But when I get up and say it, certain people will be like, oh my gosh, I needed to hear that today. And I was like, you've probably heard that a hundred times. But today was the day that you were ready for it, that you heard it the way that I needed to tell you. That was the only way your ears were going to listen to it. And I connected with you where other people weren't able to. I can't do that with everybody. There are people who hate me when I get on stage. And I'm like, <laughs> write all that down in the little comments thing and I'll make sure never to read it. But the rest of those people are like, you're amazing. I've never heard anyone say that before. And I'm like, yes, you have. But I said it the way you needed to hear it. You're welcome. And it's being able to own that and go, you're right. Like the book, I'm totally right now just being super vulnerable in a space where I've been trying to write a book for four years. And every time someone comes out with another book, I was like, I could have done that better. I could have done that better. <laughs> I, sh I should have written the book. Why haven't I written the book? And it's because it's the next new thing for me. Like launching my first course, the hardest thing I've ever done, bawled my eyes out the day that I started doing the videos. The first podcast sweat through my shirt as I was doing my first podcast episode. And then as I kept going, I was like, well, this is easy. It wasn't that hard. Getting on my first stage, sweat through everything. Like that kind of stuff. It's like the first time you have to do anything is hard. But like after you get into it, you're like, oh, but my message is different and I'm going to make sure that it stays different and I can keep growing with it because everybody has something to say and everyone has their own filter to say it with and everyone else needs to hear what we have to say. And if we don't say it, we're doing them and us a disservice. Mm, preach it. You know, that's <laughs> seriously. And that's where it really comes back to staying true to yourself because there's, when you're speaking or having a conversation with someone, it's an energy exchange. Mm -hmm. And those people that were like, oh my gosh, I so needed that today. It was because your energy is vibrated on the same level. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That person appreciated you because they heard you and it penetrated them mm -hmm. versus someone else may have said the literal exact same word, sentence, phrase, paragraph, and it whew, gone like yeah. in one ear and out the other. Yeah, I have a part of my talk and I've been putting it into more of my talks where I actually make the audience, especially if I have a little time, stand up and choose someone that they've never met before. And then I make them stand in front of the other person for two minutes without saying a word. Oh. And I walk them through a whole scenario and I start with, now I don't want you to say a word. You can make noises, you can laugh, you can cry, you can do whatever you want, but I want you just to stand there and stare at the other person. And I walk them around their face. I like have them look at their eyes and their lips and their nose and their cheeks and their hair and make them laugh and make them, you know, like it's a little silly to do that. And then I say, I want you to think of someone you love and I want you to send them all the love in the world as you're looking at this other person. Now I want you to think of someone you've lost and I have them do the exact same thing. And they are just like, I, people just start bawling and they don't like, it's hard to watch because it goes from funny to very serious very quickly. And then I say, now I want you to take everything you just wish the person you lost and wish all of that on yourself. And that's where they're like, whoa. <laughs> And so being able to give them those two minutes of energy exchange, I have them do whatever I say, do whatever you would like to do to thank the other person for being with you. The people who like, were like, oh, this is weird. I don't know what to do. They didn't feel anything. There was no connection. The people who sat there and took the time, they actually had a super connection. And then I asked them, I said, how many of you think that's awkward? And then I asked them, how many of you just made a new best friend? And like, they're all like, yes. <laughs> so it's like, how do we, we have an energy exchange with every person we meet 
And it's how we want to have that energy exchange, which comes back to brand. And that's a weird word for a lot of people. A lot of people are like, I don't have a brand. I'm like, yeah, you do. You just walked in with one. You just had a conversation with one. You are a brand, even if you don't define it, they're defining it for you because they feel something about you. And those two people who have no conversation know deeply about that other person without saying a word because they showed up for each other or didn't, Mm. depending on what happened. Wow. Because they showed up for one another. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been on one of those just amazing car rides with someone that you're just really awesome with and you've said nothing (laughs) like for long periods of time, but it's not awkward, right? You know, that's Mm -hmm. an energy exchange. It's a, it's a similar type of situation. And it's, I think sometimes we forget that we have that type of power and that so much power, so much, like Mm -hmm. it's like a power plant, right? (laughs) It's it's just, it's waiting to come out and, and just explode out of us in the most beautiful of ways but we undermine ourselves and we're like, nobody wants to hear that. Let me get quiet. But that's the part that you miss. You miss the whole connection piece. I had this, I did this in Maryland in Bethesda at the MPI conference. And there was a woman who emailed me this long email after. And she said, I just want you to know that I wasn't planning on coming to your session. It was the last session of the day. I was exhausted. I didn't really know if I wanted to be there. And she said, and I'm a single mom and my husband or my boyfriend is in the military and he's gone right now. And I don't like, I, I don't really get anything for that. Like, it just kind of sucks that he's gone all the time. And I just was like, ah, I just, maybe I just want to go home. And I just kind of feel like, Bleh, like whatever. And she's like, and not many people are in my position where they're not married, they're in the military and they're trying to figure it out. And they're doing this like weird thing. And she said, but you got up on stage and got me right off the bat. And I was like, all right, I'll stick around and I'll see what <laughs> happens. And then you made us do that weird thing where we had to stare at somebody. And she said, and I walked around the room and I was like, no one's going to want to do this. And she said, a woman walked up to her and said, I'll, I'll be your friend and stood in front of her. And she said, we didn't talk for those two minutes, but as soon as the conference was over, she looked at me and she said, who were you looking at? And she said, I was thinking of my boyfriend because he's in the military and he's gone right now. And I'm, I'm afraid that something could happen to him. And she said, me too. Oh, wow. Oh, chills. Right? Chills. And she's like, if I hadn't stayed and if I hadn't walked around and said, I'm going to connect with somebody, that person wouldn't have walked up to me and said, I'm willing to connect too. She's like, now I have a person to talk to about exactly what I'm feeling. So it's those kinds of things. Like when we show up and you don't even have to tell anything, you don't have to share anything. All you have to do is be there. And that's how that works. But we all cancel plans on each other all the time. After COVID, I'm guessing a lot more people will like not be canceling so many plans, but <laughs> true. We'll, <see. laughs> well, I love that too. And it's a great reminder that when we just show up and as ourselves and do our thing, that impact creates some sort of connection that we didn't even necessarily create. Again, I'm just going to come back to this container. Yeah. It's just because you were there being yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And now these women have built a connection like that. That's priceless. Yeah. Absolutely priceless. Yeah. I have too many stories like that. It's just the power of showing up unapologetically, Mm -hmm. honestly. A whole bunch of you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) So we have a lot, a lot, a lot of female entrepreneurs listening into the podcast. And I know that going live, showing up in our business, asking for what we want, saying, you know, yes, this is my rate and this is what I'm charging. I'm feeling called to do an Instagram live, but I feel like I'm literally going to urinate everywhere. (laughs) What type of advice and or guidance would you give to to some of those ladies? Because I know that there's a bajillion of them going, oh my gosh, yes, please. Here's my notebook. Well, I would say that's a lot of different things to give a piece of advice for. But it I is. Think- yes. I, <laughs> I <laughs> went like, around. All right. I'll just give you my, li- my list. Hold on. <laughs> no, but basically I would say the first thing to do when you have to ask for, start, or do anything that makes you scared. I mean, like I said before, I sweat profusely and just start crying when I have to do something new. Like I don't like doing new things. I don't like not knowing what the plan is. I don't like being unprepared. Like I hate that kind of stuff. And I've had to learn that I can do it. (laughs) So the thing that I tell every one of my speakers before they have to get on stage or before they have to get up and say something, or they have to start whatever that starting is, whether it's live. And I did a whole series on how to rock your videos because of the fact that I kept watching people get on and be like, (laughs) is this thing on? Can you hear me? I'm like, oh my gosh, you're killing me guys. Like, please stop doing that. Basically, all I would tell them was, what if you click the button and did this? And then started instead of, (laughs) 
because basically if you take a deep breath and you do, I do this on stage and it makes the whole audience laugh every time I get out there because they'll introduce me. I'll get out on stage and I'll be like, yeah. And I'll walk out and stand in my like pose in the middle and I'll be like, <sighs> and that's all I'll do. Wow. And a trickle of laughter through the crowd. Like, uh Oh, this is going to get weird fast. And I'll go, <laughs> yep. Then I say my first 10 words. And so whether you're asking for money, whether you're asking for a raise, whether you're asking for a person to work for you or a person to not work for you anymore, knowing what you're going to say first helps you get into everything else. So when I get on stage, I will get up, I will do this. And I did this at a financial institution. There were 42,000 freaking people in the audience, on video, across the entire world, watching me open for them. And I was like, hmm, this is gonna be cool. I'm not scared at all. This is great. So behind the scenes, I was like, 40 million Americans have used online dating. And that's all I said over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So when I walked out on stage, I was like, 40 million Americans have used online dating. And everyone was like, whoa, this is not going to be your typical financial institution. (laughs) And I was talking about data and impact and story and human about my dish method and how to pitch and everything. But I needed to have something that I could anchor myself to and go, all I have to do is say this and I'm good. Because as soon as I did that, I was able to breathe, center myself, calm myself down and bring myself to a place of, I got this. And I did. And I crushed it. And while I was in there, just a side note, I was halfway through my talk, rocking it so hard on stage that I was like, yes, nothing can ever stop me. I'm amazing. (laughs) And I'm like rocking. And all of a sudden someone goes, excuse me, ma'am. I was like, yes. Usually when you're giving a keynote, people don't interrupt you. And he said, there's a spider next to your head. Oh. I was like cool. (laughs) A spider had come down from these like ginormous vaulted ceiling somehow right next to my head. It's like literally sitting right here. And the country girl in me was just like, we're not freaking out. And then everything ran through your head. It's like being in a car accident where you're like my entire life flashed before my eyes. I was like, if I kill it, someone will be mad at me. If I throw it, they'll all run. If I like, (laughs) you know, it's like all those things, like, how do I do this? And so I, I reached up clipped it and walked it over to the wall and set it on the wall, wiped off my hands, walked back out. And I was like, so where was I? And they were all like, so amazing. And but it's being able to go, I am here. I am centered. I can focus and I can get through anything. And it starts with that breath, those first 10 words and go. So when you want to ask for a raise or you want to ask for money because you want this person to pay you money, What are the first 10 words that are going to come out of your mouth when that meeting starts? And it's not, hi, thank you for coming to my meeting. (laughs) Such a a simple yet powerful exercise. I think, first of all, we forget to breathe, right? We just immediately go into this and go and run. You know, we're, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We need to just like pause and remember that we're here in this moment. But I also Mm -hmm. love the anchor statement. It never Mm -hmm. even dawned on me. Like just know what that initial icebreaker, so to speak, is the first part is always the hardest part, right? But once you get in that groove or get in that momentum, mm-hmm. it's like, oh yeah, I've done this. I, I know how to do this. I'm just psyching myself up. Yeah. And it's having those words to say ahead of time to walk back and forth and to go, I mean, there's a m- million other things you can do like power poses and getting yourself in the right outfit to make yourself feel really powerful. Like whatever those things are, there's a lot of other things, but those two things, every single time I do anything, I'm just like, even if I went on live and I'm not a live person, I don't like being like, hi, I'm on Instagram live. What's going on? (laughs) But I also like, I have to practice those. What are my first 10 words? What's the thing I'm going to say when I get out there so that I don't like ruin this whole thing and go, all right, delete. (laughs) What would you recommend? Because it does happen because we are human when you do mess up whether it's you say a wrong word or you get stumbled over top of yourself or you just go completely blank because that's, I think, is one of, probably one of the biggest fears is I'm going to get up there and forget everything that I've ever known in my entire life. Yeah, that happens sometimes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or your slides just quit and you're like, well, there goes my presentation, shit. <laughs> well, so breathing is one of them, obviously. Like if you mess up completely and you've stumbled over your words and you've said the wrong word or whatever, or you've just completely forgotten anything, if you stop and take a breath and go, and you settle back in, those words will start coming back. 
and you'll be like, oh, okay, I was just rushing. Like I tend to stumble over words because I'm trying to talk too fast. Like my brain's going faster than my words are going. So I can't say what I need to say. I actually said a completely word, a word that doesn't even exist on stage <laughs> once. And someone was just like, you know that that's not a word. And I was like, yeah, I was an English major in college. I totally know that wasn't a word. And I'm allowed to make up words if I want, because that's how the dictionary was built. <laughs> So even if you're like, whatever, I totally messed that up. And also nobody has any idea what you're going to say. So if you completely forget everything, you can just take a breath and go, what should I say next? But don't say, this is the key. Well, just forget everything I'm about to say, because that will make you completely forget everything you're going to say. And then everyone in the audience is like, well, you're a weirdo. Okay. But if you mess up your words or if you're like tripping over your words, which I've done, like I said, I actually will say, hmm, sounds like I need to take a breath. <sighs> well, that feels better. Now I know the English language. Or sometimes I'll just be like, I uh, seem to have forgotten the entire English language. Now we're back. Okay. And then I just <laughs> keep going. And it becomes like almost a joke where it yes. just becomes like, we're all human. We mess up. That's how this works. Like they don't think that we're supposed to be perfect, but we try to be and that messes everything up. Yes, I am a huge advocate for calling myself out when I mess up when I'm speaking because I'm like, well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> you know, it's not that serious, mm-hmm. right? I think sometimes we forget that it's really not that serious. Right. And we are humans at the end of the day. And if we're just like, well, this sucks for a second. Okay. Mm-hmm. Actually, here was what I was going to tell you. <laughs> Where the technology stops working, and you're just like, well, it seems as though Mercury is in retrograde. So <laughs> technology is not going to function at this moment. Yep. I think that we forget sometimes that we can, we can address those types of situations as a human because yeah. that's who's sitting in front of us also. Well, and also having those words just in case, like knowing if I mess up, I know I'm going to say this because you can practice that. You can say, okay, if I mess up, I'm going to be like, Uh Uh-oh, everyone's going to realize I'm human. (laughs) And we're back. Okay. (laughs) It's just being able to do that. Because otherwise, if you try to make it funny and it falls flat on the audience and you haven't like practiced how you're going to say it, then that makes it even more scary. And then you're going to forget more stuff. And it's like, but also realizing they have no idea what you're going to say. Like if you get to a slide that like, I had a slide deck that one of my designers did and I don't even know what she was thinking, but she took my slide deck and completely jumbled it up, put them in the wrong places and then gave me stuff that I was like, I don't even know what that means. I literally flipped over to it and I was like, yeah, that's not sure how that one got in there. (laughs) Click the next one and kept going. I was like, whatever. But people understand we have to realize we're not superhumans on stage. We're not superhumans in front of our clients. We're not superhumans. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect. But we can also walk out there and be like, you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) I want people definitely to go to your website and check this out. But you have a webinar on the 10 ways to rock any stage. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely want people to go to your website and check this out. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. But I'm curious if you can give us kind of the Cliff Notes version or some of the tips on how, how we can just like stand in our awesome and rock it. Well, it comes down to knowing yourself and that's the hardest part of all of it because a lot of people are like, just be you. And I'm like, nah, I don't think you want everyone to be themselves. <laughs> Some people are just not nice people and that's not a good idea. But at the same time, understanding like, who am I? Where did I come from? How am I showing up? Who am I and who do I want to be? You don't have to be you because you have to be you. I mean, at the end of the day, the reason I am me today is because my mom and I quit talking for two and a half years and I realized that I was judging her thinking she was judging me. And the whole time I was like, oh yeah, well, she just wants me to be cute and adorable and funny and whatever. But in the end, I was like, but I'm an approachable badass. I'm like, I need to own that. And I don't have to wear, like I can wear tattoos, but you know, like I can wear clothes that aren't hot pink and I can do whatever I want the way that I want to. And I can cut my hair off even if she doesn't like it. I can do what I want to. But it took all that time to make me realize I was thinking that she was going to judge me for not being myself when I just needed to own who I was. And she was just like, okay, guess what? I really love you exactly for who you are. So what does your tattoo mean? (laughs) That kind of stuff started happening. And when you start owning yourself and own that, it's not about what other people think. It's about what you think. If you feel so good in your system and in your body and in your mind and how you think and what you say, own that, but get to a place where you finally get to own that. And also know that you're a work in progress and it's never going to be done. (laughs) that's also that yeah Mm -hmm. but that's a good reminder honestly because I think a lot of times we get wrapped up in getting to the finish line 
right? Yep. Well, when I reach this milestone or when I get this far, or, you know, when I do this one more thing, then I'll start doing that thing that I actually want to do. Yeah. And guess what? That day comes and goes. And before you know it, it's been a decade and you're wondering what's going on. Well, or you're like retired and you're sitting there going, oh, I was going to do all these amazing things and you have a heart attack or get cancer. Stop waiting. Don't wait to do something because you're like, someday I'm going to do it. Stop now and go, what can I do right now? That's not going to obviously be irresponsible, but be irresponsible. (laughs) Do something crazy because you want to do it. Don't wait until someday when you finally get a chance to do it, own who you are and then be the kick-ass human that you are, if that's who you are. That's who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I really just want to make sure that everyone knows that their voices really do matter, Mm -hmm. whether it's in the smallest of conversations and passing in the night or standing in front of 40,000 people. Voices matter and you matter and your energy matters because somebody needs it. Somebody's Mm -hmm. waiting on it. Honestly, I think that's mind blowing sometimes. If I think about it too much, it's almost like a twilight zone that somebody is waiting for you to step into who you are. Right. which is ultimately going to amplify them to become who they are. Like It gives them permission. Like yes. you give yourself permission to be who you are. You give other people permission to be themselves. And then everyone just feels that much more free. Amen. How That's magical. how it works. Yes. Well, as we are starting to round the bend here, is there anything else about speaking or amplifying your voice or just being a kick-ass human that you want our listeners to know about? The biggest thing I want people to know about anything is that when you start sharing your story, you will start creating ripples that you don't understand. And you won't ever be able to understand how that, that those stories affect other people. And so the more that you share and the more you're willing to share, the deeper you can be vulnerable because there are not many vulnerable people out there. And when we see those people, we're like, oh, that's amazing. How did they do that? And it was like, oh, well, I took a step and I shared a little thing. And then I shared a little more. And then I shared a little more. And then I got deeper and deeper. I mean, I feel like I'm still doing that where I like share a little bit more of me and people are like, whoa, that was really (laughs) cool. And I'm like, okay, wait till my book comes out. (laughs) But it's that ability to know that you have a story and whether you can share just a teeny piece of it to get your feet wet and to not be so scared. And then the next step and the next step and the next step, you're going to affect more people than you're talking to. So they're going to tell other people your story. Like I share a lot of stories that hundreds of thousands of people now get to share because one person shared it with me. So think about how you're sharing your story and be willing to be wrong, (laughs) be willing to be weird or not perfect And keep sharing that story because it's not about getting on stages and getting paid to speak. But man, if you want to do that, (laughs) I know how. (laughs) Melanie (laughs) spring.com. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, this is, this is great. You know, that, that ripple effect and just showing up and not being afraid to be weird or off or wrong or right. Or it's such a great reminder that just a little bit and then just a little bit and a little bit, you know, you don't have to like plow right into, okay, well, I've never really said much of anything in my life. And now all of a sudden I have to do all the things Nope, (laughs) that is, yeah, just one bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't wait to hear this answer, (laughs) but I'm super curious what gutsy means to you, Miss Melanie Spring. Mm, It's the ability to get up and say, you're welcome when you walk into a room. Uh, You know, I'm going to think of you every single time (laughs) that I'm in that situation. I'm going to be like, wait, what would Melanie do? You're welcome. (laughs) Yes, do that. I love it. (laughs) I love it. Well, this has been such a fun conversation and such an important conversation. And I know that I thank you and all of your entire audience thanks you for, for taking that first step and amplifying your voice because now you're helping other people to do that. And that's magical. So thank you for being a pioneer in that space. Thank you for having me do this with you. Like, I'm so excited to be able to hang out in your space. Oh, this is fun. How can we find you though? I want to make sure that everyone you've got courses going on, you've got 90 day challenges. Like how can we find you? How can we keep in touch? Well, the new website that we just launched in June, depending on when you're listening to this, is melaniespring.com. And then we have a 90-day challenge that starts on June, July 7th. And it's ispeakwithconfidence.com slash 90 days. And you can find that at the top of my website on melaniespring.com. You just click the button at the top. I mean, if you Google Melanie Spring, you're going to find me everywhere because I have taken that whole name and kept it as my own. So uh, well, you're welcome. As you should. <laughs> 
<laughs> I also encourage you guys to connect with Melanie on Instagram. She's super active and I'm always loving her adventures and just seeing what you're getting yourself into. It's, it's awesome and very inspiring. So thank you. Aww, thank you. Thank you. you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Join me this Thursday as we take our power back, keeping this train moving forward by speaking up. You've gotten used to telling people how bad you feel or how shitty things are or this and that and woe is me and and sometimes rightfully so. But what if you started telling your joyful truth? What if you took your power back by saying, I feel awesome. Until then, check out previous episodes at thegutsypodcast.com and for more real, raw, ridiculousness, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at that Laura Aura. And of course, as always, until I see you next time, stay gutsy. Stay gutsy.